we're delighted, uh, Kasner is delighted, to uh, invite Harold Jarshi to speak with us today. Harold is a consultant who I actually met a few years ago uh, when working with the National E-Extension Initiative. And in those early days of, uh, as we were becoming acclimated to social media and more importantly social learning, uh, we had identified Harold as, a, as someone who we wanted to invite and, and talk with. And that's the great thing about Harold is he's here not to talk to you necessarily, although he's going to do some of that, but he also wants to talk with you about this. And so Harold is from Canada, I believe New Brunswick. Uh, he had a long flight yesterday, but he's here safe and sound, and we're, we're pleased about that. Harold uh, is a graduate of the Royal Military Academy in Canada. He has been a lifelong educator. And he is working today uh, as a consultant uh, to organizations and businesses who are really interested in learning to work differently. How do you do this digital work? How do you do this digital learning? How do you build learning networks? How are people getting their information and how do we then become not just experts, but how do we become catalysts in, in learning? And so we're, uh, we welcome Harold. And he's going to talk with us about uh, his model, uh, personal knowledge mastery. And with that, Harold, you're on. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, everything could be seen. Uh, I'm not going to do a big introduction about where I come from and what I do. If you go to my website, so you can see where it is right there, jarky.com, uh, everything is there. I live online. I've had an online presence for a number of years and uh, have been sharing a lot of different things. So as deep as you want to go, you may. I know that I provided um, uh, uh, Dan with copies of my eBooks. If anybody wants to have uh, copies of those ones, uh, you, can, uh, you can just ask him or, or, and, and get copies of that if you want to read into any of the things that I'm going to be talking about. Am I talking loud enough for everybody in the back? All right, if not, please, uh, that's your job, Connie, is to make sure that I, that I, that, that I stay focused on, on, on this. So today I'm going to be talking about a framework called Personal Knowledge Mastery. I'm going to start, I'm going to explain a little bit how I got into that, where it comes from. Then I'm going to take a look at some of the things that are changing around the way that we work and that that is affecting the way that we learn and that has a direct impact on education. Right? And then I'm going to explain a little bit the PKM framework that I've developed. I'm not going to go into great detail on that, um, but I'm going to sort of give you a, a, a high level view of that. And then we should have a little bit of time if anybody wants to talk and dig deeper, they can, as well as I have a lot of online uh, resources and references if this, is, if this idea and this framework uh, has any interest for you. So I want to start with uh, a quick background on me is that I served in uh, Canada's military as an officer for 21 years. When I left the military, I took a job at a university, uh, which I thought was for life, but then they shut down my department. And three years later, I wound up working for a dot-com. The dot-com went dot-bomb. And in 2003, I found myself um, working for myself. Uh, so here I was. I live in New Brunswick, Canada. I live on the border with Nova Scotia, a town called Sackville, population 5,000. We are uh, far away. We're about 600 miles from Boston, about 600 miles from uh, Montreal, the two major cities that are close to me. Uh, very rural, kind of, kind of like, uh, like here. Uh, so we have fishing, we have forestry. Uh, those are the, uh, the, uh, the, big, uh, the, the big industries around us. And um, uh, we have the highest uh, unemployment rate in the country usually. Um, so here I was, unemployed. Uh, stay-at-home uh, mother of my two children, our two children, who were around 11 and 9 at the time, and suddenly I had to figure out how the heck I was going to do something. I had a consulting, a little bit of a consulting background, master's degree in education, worked in this technology company, military leadership management kind of stuff. Um, but I, I'd always been very interested in the internet, and so I was uh, I was fairly web savvy. And uh, one of the things that I did. When uh, I said, I, I, again, I launched my company because uh, it's better to be self-employed than unemployed. And um, I, I set up a blog. And this was still fairly early days of blogging. 
And the first little while I had some local clients and things were going okay. But as anybody who works for themselves know, things go up and things go down. And by 2004, we had a, it was a, a bit of a down period. And I was told this, is that I was writing my blog and I was talking about technology, work and learning and new ways and social media and stuff like that. And then said, but the problem is that if you give away all your knowledge, nobody's going to hire you. And this was said by Andrea Wilson. Has anybody ever heard of her? She's my wife. <laughs> um, so we had a difference of opinion. It's like, Harold, where's the money? And Harold's saying, I think maybe this internet thing is kind of good and social media is a way for me to uh, connect and collaborate because I really had no, I, I had no network, right? I had the local people that I'd worked with at, the, at this very small university, 2,000 students, so tiny, tiny liberal arts university, this uh, dot-com company that had like 20 people in it, uh, and then my military network that was still mostly in the military. And so I start, I believe that if I started putting my ideas out there, writing and adding some value, that the way that this internet economy network era is supposed to work is that that would be good for me and I would be able to build up a reputation perhaps if I had said anything that was, that was good. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know how this was going to work, right? But I understood network theory and I, you know, I've got a little bit of education. I talked to different people about different things. And so here I am in 2016, right? I'm, I, and I'm speaking here and I'm working with Extension, I'm working with Kasner and uh, I now speak all over the world. I've been on most continents. I have clients, uh, large clients, multinationals, uh, small startups and stuff like that. And the only reason that I have that is because I gave into the network, I added value to the network, and then over time, the network gave back to me. But the problem with networks is that they're not reciprocal. Is that if you give to a network, you don't get back equally and you don't know that. It's because networks are complex and by their very nature they're complex. But this, I think, is where the world is going, is that more and more as we work in networks, we have to understand networks. We have to be able to navigate networks. We have to become participating members of networks because it's your role and your reputation in a network or multiple types of networks that's actually going to influence maybe not your career, but definitely your students' careers as they move forward. And I'll give some examples of this. So this is kind of where I'm at right now. I'm not sure if anybody knows Hugh McLeod. He's a cartoonist who made his reputation on the internet. And when he published this book, Freedom is Blogging in Your Underwear, yes. And that's none of your business if I do. Um, but really, the blog gave me everything. Um, I mean, there's other work that's because of it, but because of the blog, I was able to build up an international network. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it would have been impossible for me to be working as an international consultant, a speaker, a writer, so I do public speaking all over, if I had been living in a place like Sackville, because I would have had to go through some medium, right? Now, you don't have to do that. So this, so this is my example. So I want to talk a little bit, go back in history a bit. So we go back about 100, 120 years ago, we had a significant work shift, right? So this is 1897, this is in, uh, um, uh, in Belgium, and these people here are bringing in the harvest. Do you think that they look like that 20 years later? Let's, get, let's, say, let's just say 1920. Would they have been doing the same thing? Right? What would they have been using instead? Tractors, right? You would you, you'd have one person with one tractor on there. We had a significant shift from, and you probably know that living in, uh, in a place like Nebraska, is that, look at, look at that, 50% of the population, the, and these, these are American statistics, right? Farming in 1900 and down to about 15 by 1920, right? Now, the good thing from a societal perspective and eco economic perspective is that all those farmhands, mostly young men, men, actually had a place where they could work, and that was because the factories were hiring. But we saw them leaving the land, Getting the jobs as bad as the factories were, it paid better, and it was actually a better life than working on most of those farms. Right? So that was the kind of shift that we saw just over 100 years ago. We're going through a similar shift now. So these are U.S. statistics from the U.S. Um, uh, Department of Labor. Almost half of U.S. jobs in 2014 were at a high risk of automation. Right? Everybody, that's would anybody disagree with those stats? 
Right. What's, the, what's the number one occupation in Nebraska? Truck driver, right? What, what, what's coming down the road? Self-driving vehicles. Trucks are probably coming before cars are coming, right? Only 21% of U.S. jobs are at a low, all right? So, so basically one in five jobs that we have right now are at a low risk of automation, right? This is given current technology. And we know what's happening with technology. We know what's coming along in terms of automation, right? So this is what we're all facing. And it doesn't matter where you're at. Take a look at these here. I hope you can, uh, does the laser pointer work? Okay, a little bit there. So we see a decline in, in routine cognitive and routine manual occupations, right? So we're seeing that, so the manual or the red, right? You can see that, so you can see a significant, uh, it's not very good there. Uh, drop, we're going from 1975 down to 2013. Significant drop in manual routine, slight in the cognitive routine, but they're still going down. Manual, not, even, even non-routine work that is manual, right, is not increasing a lot. Why? Because we're building better machines and better robots to do that type of work. And the only increase in work type that we're seeing is in non-routine cognitive work. Well, what's non-routine cognitive work? Right? That's where you're doing something different. Right? That's where you're using your brain. That's where you're being creative. That's where you're trying new things. That is the only place where we're seeing an increase in work. Non-routine cognitive occupations. So that's the future. For anybody who actually wants to have a job, and if you're looking at somebody who's younger in 20 or 30 years, that's where they're going to have to be. If anybody disagrees or has issues, I mean, by, we, can, we can jump into that. So this shows it right here. <coughs> We're basically seeing a switch from 1975, 60% routine occupations, right, and 40% non-routine. Now, by 2013, getting into 2016, right, we got 60-40 split, the opposite, right? 40% now are, non are, are, are routine and 60% are non-routine. I think there's a trend here. I think it's going to continue. Look at this one here. Can you read that? It says average company lifespan on the Standard & Poor 500 index, right, from 1960 to 2025. Is there a pattern? So what does that mean? If the average company lifespan is decreasing from an average of 60, and now we're down to an average of 10 or 15, what does that mean for the 22-year-old who graduates from here? What do they have to look forward to? Right? They have to look forward to a number of shifts. They have to look forward to probably no company pension plan. They also, in terms of if you're going to invest in something that's going to support you, are you going to invest in your company or should you be investing in something else? Because right? one thing that doesn't change over time are people and relationships. So I went through a dot bomb. Right? There are 20 some of us in the company. And then when they closed uh, the department at my university, there were about uh, 15 of us there. And probably the best thing that, that could happen to me with those two closures was that we all went to different places. So instead of me just having two networks, right, sort of the, this place called the Center for Learning Technologies and this company called Ecom, is that instead I had 20 different networks, people, that I, who, people who were doing different things. So actually, those companies closing and everybody going in different directions made for a much more diverse professional network for me. So in looking back on it, that was actually a good thing because some of my ex-colleagues became partners, some of them became clients, some of them I actually subcontracted uh, to do work for me, right? But if they'd all been stayed in the same organization, that wouldn't have been as good. So if you're looking at this from the perspective of an individual, okay, company lifespan is going down, right? but I'm building new relationships each time that I work in a, in a company for my, my 10 year period or five year period or two year period or something like that. What for me is really important? It's developing relationships with other humans. It's how do I, because the thing is over time, we may cross paths again. So how do I then you know, develop a diverse knowledge network, a professional network, because the, you know, you're looking at everything, is it okay, work, is, is shifting and looks like what worked today is not going to work tomorrow. Um, software is eating up jobs. Uh, software is eating up um, a, a lot of the procedural work that we're doing. Uh, ben Hammersley, who used to advise um, uh, uh, David Cameron in the UK, said that you know, if you can 
if, if you can make a flow chart to chart any process, software will do it. So if anything that you do in your job, we can actually flow chart it out, it will be gone sooner or later. So what's the internet doing? So the internet, you know, the web came around 1995. Um, does anybody, has anybody heard of the Clue Train Manifesto? Oh, at least one, okay. Clue Train Manifesto was written in 1999 for Four, four guys, uh, Doc Searles, Dave Weinberger, um, uh, Chris Levine, and I'm trying to remember the fourth one. Anyway, uh, and it was, it, was, it was interesting. If anybody um, has uh, studied um, uh, Protestant history and Martin Luther, and he put up his 95 theses on the wall of uh, Württemberg Cathedral back in uh, the 1500s, and it was 95 theses against uh, how the church had to change. Well, they wrote 95 theses about how business has to change because of the internet. It's called the Clue Train Manifesto, and it's on cluetrain.com. It's still there as an, ar as an internet archive. It's been published as uh, two editions of a book. Definitely worth a read. Um, but one of the theses of the 95 theses that they have is that hyperlinks subvert hierarchy. You think about that. Hyperlinks subvert hierarchy. Well, why? Well, because we've created, I mean, you take a look at it, is that I can send even, I can send a message or connect to anybody without the permission of somebody else. I could create my blog without anybody's permission, and suddenly, and people could hyperlink to it, and I didn't, need, I didn't have to go through a publishing house, I didn't have to go through a company, didn't have to go through a business. Students can do the same thing. Right? They can use uh, uh, something like Yik Yak to talk about what's going on within the class or whatever, Snapchat or Instagram, a picture of the professor doing something silly or whatever. They don't have to ask permission to do any of that stuff anymore. Right? So hyperlinks subvert hierarchy. And the three things that I think that are important is that because of that, that means that we have pretty well unlimited information. I know there's some information that's not available, but for the most part, we can find out almost anything that we need about most things, right? That's available, and I don't need to go to the library. I remember going to the library, getting internet library loans and all that kind of stuff. Now you don't need to do that. Now, you may have to dig deeper than just Wikipedia, but you can get most of it, right? Self-publishing, right? That was the revolution that allowed me to start my business, right? If I didn't have the ability to self-publish, there's no way that I would have been able to grow my business, right? And the internet allowed it, and it cost me $300 a year, right? Because I just pay for my web hosting, that's it. And then lastly, Seb Paquette uh, is a good friend of mine, he's in the Montreal area. Seb wrote the first doctoral thesis on blogging back in the 90s. Uh, really smart guy, but he coined this term, he says, what social media do, so social media is just a different way of the web and the internet, it's just a little bit higher up level. Uh, what they do is that they allow for ridiculously easy group forming. That means that anybody with an affinity can get together. Whether that could be Al-Qaeda, it could be Daesh, ISIL, ISIS type folks. It could also be left-handed bagpipers. It could be people who are interested in the decline of the bee population. It doesn't matter. Anybody can get together as a group really easy. And, you know, social media like Facebook are, uh, make that even easier to do. Right? So this is what we're seeing. And that, those three things there are destroying, breaking apart, a lot of the hierarchical relationships that existed. Putting into question our institutions. Name one institution that people generally agree upon is doing well. The church, the government, corporations, you know, the military, the NSA. I mean, there isn't one, right? Because why? Because we're moving into this new network era and our old institutions are not designed for it. So this, I'll spend a little bit of time on this one because this is a little bit more complicated. Basically what I'm showing here is that the green, okay, that's the um, routine standardized work, right? And which was typically characterized by what we call, what, what I call labor, but really when we, when we hired people to do work and we still, have or, uh, we still are structured in some ways in that green uh, industrial economy, right? Um, is that we want people who are diligent, we want people who are obedient, right? And we want people who, have, uh, who have intelligence. The thing is, is that those three things can be done by software. They can be done by robots much better than they can be done by humans. You know, robots are way more diligent than any of us, right? So what we, what we designed for, what we hired for, back, you know, for most people, even as, 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 as not that far long ago as 1975, 
you know, where it was 60-40 split. We're now in 2015, 2016, and we're going to that 60-40 split the other way. And really is that what people are being hired for, where the valued work is, is in what I call talent. Right? And the talent, which is enhanced by the connectivity so that we can have the ridiculously easy group forming. So I, can blow, so I, I belong to several organizations that are multinational, 6, 10, 20 consultants, and we can form and do work together. We couldn't do that before, right? but now we can, and now we have the software to do it. We connect and we can communicate with each other. And what drives us and, and, and makes us of value to organizations are those curiosity, creativity, and empathy. That's what people are looking for, right? Curiosity, because you're trying new things out. Creativity, because you, you're, you're actually doing them. And then the empathy, which of course is that when the robots are doing everything and the software is doing all that routine stuff, well, what, what is it that we as humans, as clients, as customers want? We want the empathy, you know? I mean, how many people like calling up a 1-800 helpline and going through the tree, right? But imagine calling that number up, which in some places you can, and a human answers it, right? And it's kind of like, you know, that's, what, that's what we're looking for, that's what we want. It's the same thing as in, 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 in healthcare, right? We want, we want good diagnos diagnostics, but we really want to have that human-to-human -human connection. And that's where the value is coming more and more as the software and the bots and the automation is looking after all that routine stuff. So training humans to, to be more like uh, machines is a losing game. What we have to do is that we have to train ourselves, help other people, help students be more <coughs> talent and less labor. The thing with non-routine work right, is that it's contextual and requires greater implicit knowledge. So you know the difference between explicit and implicit knowledge, right? Explicit knowledge is a cookbook, right? So you, it's explicitly written, it tells you how to do it. Implicit knowledge is a chef with a cookbook or without the cookbook, right? What, you know, so I can take a cookbook and I can prepare a meal and a chef can use his implicit knowledge and can prepare the same meal with the same ingredients. Which one's going to be better? And my wife will answer that one very very, very clear, it was definitely the chef, right? The sh because the, sh the chef has the how-to. But how does a chef become a chef, right? It's not just by reading cookbooks. It's not even just by cooking, right? It's through le modeling, learning from others, being a sous chef, right? Working with others, connecting with other chefs, trading recipes, being creative, trying different things and all that kind of stuff. So that, this non-routine type of work, the creative work, okay, requires more of that type of knowledge. And that knowledge is the kind of stuff that's really hard to codify. It's hard to put into a curriculum. It's hard to train people for it specifically. So here, when we take a look at this shift from the industrial to this, to the, to this creative economy, is that more and more of the knowledge that's required is implicit. Right? And more and more of the learning to support that knowledge is informal. Because how do we, so implicit knowledge, the, the old uh, guilds understood implicit knowledge, right? So you became an apprentice, right? And, uh, and you spent time making things, but you were also within a community. And what was interesting is that it, you didn't work, as an apprentice, you didn't work for the master. You worked for a journeyman. The journeyman was on the path slightly ahead of you, right? And it was over time that then maybe you became a journeyman, and then after having been a journeyman for a number of years, then you could make your master work and become a master. So they realized that modeling, practice, community, learning together was the way in which they could um, uh, master their craft. Right? And we still see that in the fine arts. You see that in the fine arts schools, whether if, if, if you're, I mean, you can't become a painter by just reading about art history and painting, right? You have to paint. So if you take a look at how they do it, the studios, the way that it's practiced, it's multiple copies of the same thing over and over. It's about mastering a craft, those kinds of things. Because there's an implicit knowledge. You, can, it, you, can't, uh, you can't codify painting and say, here's how you paint, right? But a good painting you know, has that empathy, has the creativity, has that you know, curiosity in trying out different types of things, and that's how we as humans are going to be creating value on top of what the machines are doing for us. And the other thing we know about implicit knowledge is that it's shared through observation and, con and conversation, right? Again, the, in this case, these are a bunch of workers preparing to start their day at a, at a large farm, or no, in a, in a hotel. 
and uh, they have their morning coffee, and uh, one of the fellows preparing some of the food, and this is where they, this is where they sit and they chat, right? Um, I'm sure there's lots of information that's passed on that way. The same thing as uh, uh, you see pictures of um, uh, fishermen coming back a uh, hundred years ago or so, coming back from, uh, from a fishing trip, and what do, they, what do they wind up doing? They sit on the wharf and they repair the nets. And as they're sitting and repairing the nets, what are they doing? They're probably talking. They're telling stories. They're sharing things. You know, the young are learning from the old, that kind of stuff. So that is how, over time, this type of knowledge transmission has happened. And we also know that implicit knowledge is developed through social relationships. We have, there is solid research that shows that professionals need to have a strong social relationship with someone and a high level of trust before they are willing to talk about something that is very complex in their field. Right? So it is only with people, okay, you're, I'm a biologist, you're a biologist, and we're going to talk about something very, very specific, and we start getting really down into the, you know, the esoterics of it, stuff that you know, the average layman doesn't talk about, is that I'm not going to you know, reveal everything I think about this or share these things unless I actually trust you, and that takes time. So how do you build trust amongst professionals so that they're willing to share that, that type of knowledge? And we're dealing right now with, everybody's familiar with the term big data? Yeah, right, is that it's all, and big data is going to do everything. It's all, big data is going to, is going to take away everybody's job. It's going to, it, it's going to be smarter than we are and all that kind of stuff. Um, big data is going to be really important, I think. But I think that if you connect big data with big humanity, we can do some pretty cool stuff. So you take a look at, because you take data, it needs knowledge to be information. Right? So I can have a whole bunch of data, but unless, uh, oh, look at all that information there, but unless, uh, uh, unless I have some knowledge, I can't read it. I can't translate it. I can't do anything with it. And the same thing with the, I take data and I provide, so let, let's just say that we have um, uh, uh, inspection reports that come through. Right? And with my knowledge, I can read them and I can say, you know what, things are not very clean you know, here today. But if I add data and story, I understand the context of it. Oh, the story is, is that there was the annual graduation yesterday and that this happens every year and we know that this is, this, that, that this is an anomaly and not the, uh, and not the normal case. Right? And it's that knowledge and the story, so the knowledge that we share and the stories that we share and tell each other that actually creates the culture of the organization. And so if you get an organization that has the knowledge and the story they, can, they, they have the knowledge and the story to be able to make sense of all the things that are going on around them. And that becomes a challenge as well, is that the stories that we tell each other inform the way the organization works and the way that we're going to work. So, does anybody know of George Box? Okay, this isn't his quote, but it's close to. This is another uh, gaping void uh, um, uh, uh, cartoon here. And uh, every model is wrong, but some are useful. Uh, Box actually said every model is flawed, but some are useful, but uh, pretty, pretty close there. So we know that. And what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you a flawed model. Right? It's my model. This is the one that I started on in 2004. And uh, I originally designed it for myself because, so here I was in 2003, 2004. Canadian dollar was where it's at now, where it's 77 cents US. It was really expensive coming down here in those days. Um, and uh, so I couldn't afford a lot of uh, professional development and I had to figure out how the heck do I, if I want to be a consultant, I have to know stuff, I have to be smarter than other people or know more things, and how do I stay current in my field? And there are a few people who inform me and uh, my books or my website, you can see where it is, people like Lily Afamova who was doing a doctoral th uh, uh, thesis at the time at uh, University of Twente in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, and she was looking at how people were using blogs as a way of knowledge sharing. And I started looking at social media of, uh, as a way for me to connect with others without, without leaving my home and staying in my underwear. So here's the sort of the, the general, my, my general theory of everything, I think, is, uh, is what Karen calls it. So, or, or <laughs> the three bubble model. But if you take a look at this, start with the blue, right? So you look at down the, the, the bottom left hand corner is that we do work and we have to share complex knowledge, right? And we need to have trust to do that. And that, and that, and that to get work done, right, we, have to, we need to have some type of control because if not, things aren't going to get done. There, we have project management, deadlines, deliverables, and things like that. And we have to work in a unified and collaborative way. 
And collaboration is people working together towards a common aim, objective, or mission. Okay? And if you look at the top right there, is it uh, social networks? We all know what social networks are, not necessarily all online uh, networks, but social networks are usually open and networked, right? And diverse and cooperative. Diverse meaning is that you've got a whole bunch of people. It's not like everybody works for the same company. And cooperative, cooperation is different from collaboration. Cooperation is where you give freely without any expectation of direct uh, recompense or there's no quid pro quo in that. It's like posting a video on YouTube, right? You, a lot of people are doing it. I know one of the big communities on YouTube are knitters. Right? And that the, and knitters share stuff with each other, right? And there's it's a, it's a, millions of people who are knitters who share their tricks of the trade and things like that, right? They are cooperating because it's a good thing is what they like to do, right? Um, and then there's this really neat, interesting space in the middle, which are communities of practice, and a lot of people don't belong to them. I see this as a growing area for people who work in education. Is that how do you um, find and support? and use communities of practice to connect that stuff outside the organization because the thing is, is that no organization is as smart as what's outside. Right? It doesn't matter where they are. And with the work being done. So how do we connect those three things together? Right? This is the organization of today and the near future. And this is the individual in that organization who's doing a dance constant between those three spaces. One minute I'm on Facebook or Twitter where I'm connecting with somebody who's, that's an interesting new idea. Another one I'm in with a group of current like-minded uh, people within a closed environment and we're talking about, hey, uh, I want to try something new, but you know, I can't really do it in the company, but is there a way in which we can sort of field test this thing out? Or we can do it on the side of the company. It's kind of like almost like an applied research thing. And then at the same time, I've got work I've got to get done. I've got to ship. I've got to teach. I've got to do those kinds of things. And, as, and your knowledge worker working, the people who are talent, people who are doing non-routine, creative type of work, are going to be constantly dancing between those three spaces on, 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 a, on a daily basis. And they do that by working out loud and learning out loud. Because we know about the modeling. We know about that we have to talk to each other. The social aspects is that if we don't share, right, we're not going to, we're not going to be able to keep up. And so you look at the colors here, green, red, blue. So this is, this is the PKM model. So personal knowledge mastery, generally speaking, and it goes down, it's like an, it's like an onion. This is the outer layer of the onion. So what it is, it's engaging with professional social networks, right? And then I, I liken it to breathing in and breathing out. So you're out in your social networks, you're breathing in, right, through your communities of practice, you're filtering information, you're filtering knowledge, right, and then you're making sense of that with your teams and your projects and, 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 and your workplace where you're maybe trying new methods out, right. You're then internalizing that, you're sense making, and then you're breathing out in terms of what's the team doing, sharing some of that, discerning when it's appropriate to share that. It may be over a period of time. It may be with only with people inside the organization. And then back out again. So it's this br constant breathing in and breathing out of information, knowledge, practices, new ways of doing things. Right? So how does somebody do And you need to have, therefore, you need to have networks. You need to have so, uh, professional social networks. And one of the most difficult things is having a diverse enough one, one that has uh, conflicting points of view, engaging with them so that we can stay very, very sharp. So what's a professional? Professional is someone who's currently pushing the borders of their professional competence. So that's where we're getting the new ideas, the innovative ideas, the half-baked ideas out there. We're also active within communities of practice because we're all trying to up our game. Right? And then we're using that to help do the work that we're doing. And that what we're learning through doing that work, we are then sharing back out through those three. So sometimes it may be a conversation I'm having with a colleague. Another time it might be I'm writing a blog post for the world or an article for HBR or something like that because now is a year later is the appropriate time to do that. So it's very similar to the academic cycle except it's less defined right? in terms of you know, publishing peer review and those kinds of things. But this is a constant thing. And there are tools, there are practices that enable people to do that. And that's when I, again, the stuff that you can read up about, there are a number of different techniques and practices. Institute for the Future, uh, a few years ago, published 10 future work skills. 
PKM aligns with four of them. So you've got media literacy, right? So how do I use social media for professional purposes? Uh, cognitive load management. How do I offload some of my cognitive load to the network? And there are ways, very, very effective ways of doing that. A friend of mine calls it is that let the network do the work for you. But if you don't have a network, it can't do that. So you have to have a network to offload the work. Because I engage online with a lot of people, if I have a question, I can put it on Twitter, and pretty good chance that of the thousands of people who follow me, one person might pick it up and help me. It happens to me all the time. But that's only because I give, then in return I get, but not directly. Uh, sense making, how do I, so because I'm active in writing, book reviews, all the different things, I'm, I'm doing this on a regular basis, it sharpens the brain, and I'm actually better able to make sense. I create these kinds of models, right? And then social intelligence as well. The more that you, you interact with other people, the more your social intelligence should increase. Right? Because we, we learn through modeling. We learn through all of that. So this is, uh, it's, this is on my website, uh, jockey.com slash PKM. So basically, personal knowledge mastery is personal. Right? So someone else is not telling me how to. So that means there's no, there's no best way to do this. Right? There are, I have examples on my blog of different uh, types of practices, and I've collected dozens of them, and there are hundreds. Everyone's doing it a little bit differently. Knowledge, for me, for the, defined in this case, is more than know how, know what, know who, know where, those kinds of things. And then the mastery is a journey to mastery to have the discipline to be doing this without supervision and that you're doing this continuously, sharpening the stone as a, or sharpening the sword as a, as a professional. So here's an example. So PKM, uh, probably uh, Bangor University, uh, there were a number of faculty who came and took one of my workshops online uh, from the de Department of Psychology. And uh, they took the workshop and they said, this kind of makes sense because really what you're doing is that you're developing this framework for people to take control of their professional development. Is that kind of like that? I uh, said, we would like to take this and make it part of the four-year psychology undergraduate program. And Bangor is actually one of the uh, highest rated uh, psychology programs in the world. Um, and they said, okay, let's, uh, let's see if we can do that. And so we worked with them uh, to where would you do it, what are the different kinds of things you could do. And one of the aspects of it was that these people graduate and they go to all different fields of study. Some go into clinical psychology, some go into industrial, some, uh, they, they, they work in, and some don't even go into psychology, they go into sort of uh, related fields. And they, uh, they implemented the program and, and part of it was you have to from day one in first year, uh, establish an external presence on, on the web. It could be a blog, it could be something different, but you have to be engaging with the world outside about the stuff that you're doing. And uh, uh, one student was, uh, was doing this and she was talking about some specific aspects of mental health. And um, uh, she, so this blog went on for, for, for a while. and was actually getting pretty good traffic. Uh, the number of people uh, were coming and she was engaging back and forth. And uh, the she had somebody contact her and said, you know, I really like what you're doing. Um, where do you teach? I said, well, I'm a third year student at University of Bangor. I said, oh. He said, I head up the graduate uh, department at University of California, Berkeley. Would you like a scholarship to come, and, uh, come here and do your graduate work? If she had not engaged externally, that wouldn't have happened, right? So that's the whole thing. There was no plan that, you know, that she was going to be going off and uh, uh, be able to, uh, 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 to go someplace else. You don't know what's going to happen. But the thing is, I use an example of Twitter. Everyone knows what Twitter is. I presume, who's on Twitter? Uh, about half, that's not bad, okay, good. Um, so if you go on Twitter, right, and you just sit there and you don't engage, right, and you ask a question, uh, who's gonna hear it, right, nobody. Right, because no one's going no one's gonna follow you except the bots. Unfortunately, that we do have bots on Twitter, um, and so it's not gonna help. But if you are active and you're connecting and you're sharing things, and then you put something out, who's going to hear you? More people. There's a greater chance of that. So the thing is, is that if you're not out there, you don't exist. If you're not on the network, you're not part of the network. And if you don't give to the network, the network doesn't give back to you. It doesn't matter what kind of a network it is. Right? Is that that's the, that's the law of networks, right? Is that, is that networks reinforce, if you are a contributing node, then you will have more links into you and more links out to you. And because of that is that you will have better chances of more connection and what I call enhanced serendipity. The more connections you have, the more things you do, the more that you engage, the greater the chances of some good things happening. 
because you actually because you're open to them. Um, anybody read Stephen Johnson's book on uh, on innovation? Uh, he has a great saying, and he says he says chance favors the connected mind, right? And that's really what it is: is that is that we need to have chance to favor us, and that we need to be connected. And we actually there's actually a way of going about and doing it. It's a it's a discipline. PKM is 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 one way of looking at it. There are other uh, there, there there are other methods. Uh, for the most part, this is one that uh, uh, that works that works fairly well. Um, it's been used in a number of different universities, a number of different organizations that have adopted it, uh, some large companies. It's still relatively new, even though I've been working at it for 10 years. It's been about two or three years since there's been, uh, since there's, there's been big um, interest in it. Now I can pause, now we have time, that's good. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for your comments. We've been talking about some of these things with regards to our environmental studies program since we kind of renovated it in about 2000, 2010. Just to reinforce some of the things that you just said in the context of students, I just sent out a, uh, a note on LinkedIn and, and uh, Facebook last week asking students to tell us where they're, where they're at and then advice for their, um, for their colleagues or the ones that are coming up the line. And one of them was, well, in fact, one that showed up multiple times is this whole business of networking and making sure that you're establishing your networks. The other thing that I found interesting was is uh, you need to push yourself beyond your comfort zone, which was rather interesting because I'm certainly not that type of a person. But in any case, they're, um, they're doing it. One question, my question is, is you've seen this being done in some, in some universities and we've seen uh, you know, the, the, the model that the universities are based on, are this on, or in fact all education is somewhat based on is this manufacturing mode. You know, we come in at first grade, we go to second grade, and we move them right along. And, um, but clearly that, that is not a, the model is not going to work. And so I guess I, I'd be curious what your thoughts are in terms of the future of higher education in the sense of, this knowledge changing so fast, or this way of doing things, is are the universities going to be able to uh, keep up? And my suspicion is, is that the way we're functioning right now is that we've got real problems. And so I'd be curious to your thoughts on yeah. that. Yeah, everybody has problems. Every organization, again, it's like name name one institution that's functioning well. Uh, the uh, the network era is really throwing us all for a loop. We don't know what the answers are. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we're going to see a demise of higher education. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to happen real slowly and then real fast, usually is the way that things go. Um, you, actually living out here, you might uh, have heard of the Chautauqua. Does anybody, so what, what, what were the Chautauqua? They were these traveling, educational, informational, social caravan circuses almost, but they weren't circuses, but they were about sharing information and knowledge, and they traveled all over, particularly uh, the western part of the United States. Is that correct? If I'm wrong, please correct me on this. I'm trying to remember. So the Chautauqua, uh, where uh, they grew in, 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 in interest, and, and some of them had uh, tens of thousands of people that, that attended them. And I believe in, so in, in 1919, 1920, uh, they had the most ever. It was like 200,000 Americans attended a Chautauqua. It was huge, it was, and particularly out here in the Midwest and stuff in these rural communities. The next year, zero. So you don't see the change coming until it's too late, I think, is, is, uh, is part of it. Um, uh, now, in, in terms of my recommendations, is, is it, you know, if you're looking for change, you know, look around the edges, right? Is that you're seeing extension particularly being one because ex extension works at the, at the edges and see what they're doing and see what works there. Uh, you're seeing things like MOOCs. Um, I don't think that any single one of those things is going to uh, really revolutionize uh, the way things are. Uh, but you see a gradual change as you're getting uh, fewer tenured faculty coming in from the lower, is that correct, younger? There are fewer positions now than there were. Um, us old people are getting older. Uh, we are going to retire and then die. And then die. Um, so that's going to make a big shift, I think. Um, so again, I'm not quite sure what the answers are. I think one of the short-term answers, yeah, well, we're, well, make sure I get, there we are. Okay, short-term answer probably is this one here. So this is the Seek Sense share I talked about. 
and that uh, you've got sense making across and then sharing, right? So if I'm low sense making, low sharing, I'm generally a consumer. Uh, if you're taking a look at where most academics are, they're at the bottom right, they're experts, right? And they're only sharing through, their, through, through things. If you're thinking about how are we going to help our students become better networkers, how are we going, to, and, that, that, and that none of us are, are, are expert enough in this field where everything is changing and everything is overlapping and microbiology is overlapping with nanotechnology and you name it and it's just one thing after another, is that a role in a lot of organizations really should be, particularly as an educator, is to be a knowledge catalyst. And that's someone who connects the consumers, the experts, the other people, and brings, the, the, uh, uh, brings them to bear. Still an expert in their own right, but an expert who's also doing this, not just sharing, but also connecting people together, doing things like network weaving. So I know you, and I know you, and you two don't know each other, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect you because I know the two of you are interested in a certain thing, right? So now you, don't know to, now you don't need to know me, and now I've just made the network more resilient. So where I work with the people, a lot of people I do, they actually use a little triangle signal, um, symbol when they do that, and it's just a normal way of doing, say, I'm closing a triangle here, bang, done, okay, yeah, got it. And it's just a way of working and connecting for people who work in networks. So that making those kinds of things more natural, I, I, I think helps. I think in terms of uh, uh, if you're if you're a professional in organization, that it's for insurance. I would be looking outside and I would be seeing what's happening, and I'd be looking at doing more uh, extending. Because the thing is, if you are a catalyst, right? the chances are that, that, that you're going to be valued by the network, and the network may not be your current employer, it may be your next employer. A friend of mine, John Stepper, works at Deutsche Bank as a managing director. He was getting a little concerned about uh, his job wasn't going that well and things like that. Uh, he thought that he was probably going to lose it. And one of the things he started doing is he started writing a blog externally, a professional blog, and uh, one of the uh, topics that he talked about was working out loud. John just finished writing a book on working out loud, and now all over the world there's these working out loud circles. And the company uh, has seen the value of working out loud so much that he now gives 30% of his time at work to working out loud and promoting that. That was something he created his, his own job while working in a job to do the new thing. I think you probably see that, you see that in academia too, with people who are working on projects or they're collaborating with people and they're getting, they're leveraging external funding and things like that. I think we just have to be doing even more of that because it's a networked world. Um, yeah, but I, I, I don't think universities are going to close in the next five years, but some might. And I hope that was lots or enough or too much or... How do you manage the platforms that are out there? You talk about Twitter. How do you, how do you manage the platforms that are out there, like Twitter or? Facebook, uh, when I when you first started hearing about networking, it was all no. MySpace. And it MySpace. doesn't even exist anymore. No. Uh, LinkedIn, so do you have to be on all of them, or how do you manage that? Uh, I use the adage of let the network do the work. So um, in my case, I'm not on Facebook, but my wife is. So I know what my kids are doing <laughs> because she's, oh, I can go in and take a look at that. And I don't manage that. I, I just don't like Facebook. Uh, I, I, when I recommend uh, uh, these things to people, I get them to start with one. Start with something relatively simple and don't try it. I mean, don't do three or four or five and see where the value is in it. And if it doesn't work, all right, you know, try it for six months. Like with Twitter, my re general recommendation for Twitter, the easy, if you're not on Twitter, you're thinking about it, is that f number one, figure out why you're on Twitter. It could be because you want to connect with people in your community. It could be because you want to connect with people in your professional field. It could be a field of interest. It could be uh, uh, politicians. It could be people who tell jokes. There's some really good uh, comedians on Twitter. You can just follow comedians. Say, okay, that, that's my objective. I'm just following comedians. I want fun. All right? And then what do you do is that you use the search function, you figure out who's, um, who's a comedian and who are the comedians following and who are they connected to. And I recommend following 20 to 30. That's a, that's a good number to start with. And then just dip in once a day, read through what you want. And humans are really good at pattern recognition. And that over time, you'll start seeing patterns. You say, well, that person's boring. Well, that one's interesting. And then you bring, and then you start tuning your network for signal versus noise, right? So you bring in the ones that bring in for what you consider more signal, which is more valuable information, and the ones that are too much noise, you unfollow, you mute, you get rid of them, and you attenuate the signal. You say, you know, Twitter's a really good place for me to get some of the best jokes around. And 
and you can do the same. So I use, tw I use Twitter mostly for professional, but also for local, and so I have a few different threads that I use, and I use lists to do that. Um, but start small, stay focused, have an objective. And uh, social media are like languages, and we're all adults. And has anybody here learned a second language as an adult? <laughs> or has anybody tried to learn a, a second language as an adult? Okay, we've got a few there. And we know it's really tough. Why? Because we don't like sounding stupid, right? And as, you know, I learned, my, I learned my second language when I was six, so that was really easy. I learned my third language when I started learning it when I was 18, and that was way tougher. And that took me about 10 years to actually feel comfortable doing it. And we, uh, as adults, you know, we're, we, we think a certain way. We don't want to look. We don't want to look stupid. We don't want to make mistakes, right? We want to be really good at something to begin with. Well, social media the same way. When you start on social media, guess what? You're going to sound like a toddler when you start, and you're just going to have to accept that and work with other people and develop it. Probably one of the best people who started on Twitter, uh, really amazing to watch, was Margaret Atwood. Anybody know who Margaret? So Ma Margaret Atwood is a, is a pretty famous Canadian writer, lots of prizes, lots of books. Uh, um, and she got on a Twitter not that long, but maybe five years ago, maybe a little bit less, and uh, she didn't know it. And she got on and I, I, I noticed she was on, so I followed her. And uh, she, she was making all kinds of mistakes. And I would say, no, you have to use RT for retweet and all that kind of stuff. But she was just so open to say, so she said, I don't care if I look stupid. And now she's a, she's a master on Twitter, right? Because she, was just, she went in with that open learning, I'm OK to, to do that. So that is, that's the toughest challenge for any professional adult, is that you're going to have, which is why sometimes if it's your first foray into social media, don't use it for, for professional purposes. You know, if you're a fly fisher, fisherman, go for fly fishing, right? And do that and, that, and stay with that. And then you'll actually be able to learn how to speak the language. And then maybe you want to go into a professional network after that. In your consultation work, when you are trying to assist people to change paradigms from not being a believer to being a believer and adopter, how do you deal with um, educating them on web literacy, specifically in terms of safety and security? Because I am an internal consultant here at the university. Right. And my job is to help faculty get onto this. But um, I find it a little bit hard sometimes to, um, to share the dangers on the extreme, not knowing about the safety security and just accidentally doing things that would cause a problem later on versus being overly um, worried about things and not even trying. How yeah. do you deal with that? There, there actually, there's a few, um, I have them on my outboard brain, um, on uh, social media policies. I actually have a whole collection of social media policies from, from various uh, companies. And one of them is uh, really, really simple. And it's something like, if you can't show this to your mother, don't write it. You know, and in some ways, that you, know, you can use some, a general one like that. Is that if, you, if, if you're not comfortable having this printed in the local newspaper, then, then don't put it out there. Uh, that can be uh, one of the ways. And that, um, you make mistakes. Uh, I made a, I don't know, call it a mistake. I'm not quite sure. A uh, number of years ago, I was, uh, I, I was participating in a, in a chat on, a, on another blog. So the blog was on intellectual property. And someone from a major telecommunications company was making some comments. And I called them to task on that. And I said, you know, you, you're an oligopoly. In, in Canada, we have only three major telecommunications companies. And there's price setting. And I mean, the, we have some of the highest telecoms rates in the world. And, uh, and I said to him is that, you know, you have to understand this. And, that, and I quoted actually something from the Clue Train Manifesto. And, and one of the theses is that sometimes your markets are laughing at you. Right? And it's, it's geared towards companies. And I quoted that in there. He, which I didn't realize, went to his company's uh, legal department and wanted to know if he could sue me for libel for making a comment on another blog. And, and he, they couldn't, but I was flagged right, uh, because of that. Several months later, I was engaged by that company to do some consulting. And of course, all contracts go through legal. My name came up. And they said, we can't hire you. To do that, so I paid a price for being open on that. Those kinds of things are going to happen. I think a lot of it is just you, be an adult. Uh, again, it's your would, particularly if it's an open social media thing. Is that would you be comfortable showing your husband, wife, mother, kids this? 
And if you, and you say, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong here, then I think it's okay. I mean, you can still have an opinion, I think. Um, and then like, but like learning a language is start and watch and you're not going to learn unless you do it and, and yeah, make some mistakes and don't do, who was it, Senator, uh, the Senator in the boxer shorts or whatever. So, so yeah, uh, forget who that was, but, or, or some of those other crazy things. But I mean, so is it more that people are scared or is it more that? No, the ones that I usually see is people don't understand the dangers of their personal identity. So they just randomly see, oh, I don't remember my password, username, oh. I've got a Google account from five years ago, and they just randomly open up four or five different ones, not realizing that their identities are still out there. Yeah. And it actually can work against them if they don't take care of all those loose accounts out there. That's, that's definitely one. And I mean, I mean, one of the tools that I strongly recommend is, uh, is a password manager. I use one called pa One Password. It generates my passwords for me. It manages them for, them for me. And it's, uh, it costs money, but it's worth it. I mean, all of my passwords are that long. And I don't even, I don't even know what my passwords are. Right, they're all within. They're all within the vault of of, of one password. That makes it really easy. Because then I also have a list of all the all, all the things that I've. Because uh, I can, if I don't go to a website for three years, one password at least remembers it and has that. So I, I think that that's that, that's definitely part of it. Because passwords are an issue. Um, the, your accounts are, are an issue as well. Um, George Kuros. Anybody know George? Uh, he's online, very active. Uh, he's up uh, basically due north of us. I think he's in Saskatchewan. So he's uh, educational technology, mostly K to 12 sector. And uh, George's um, uh, persona has been stolen. Uh, in the, his picture have been, has been stolen and new Facebook accounts and other ones have been created. Facebook is doing nothing about it. Uh, Boing Boing even picked, up a, picked it up and, and Facebook has done nothing. So this is happening everywhere. I have people who, uh, you can actually, if you search my name on Twitter and go through all the various accounts, you'll find some people with my picture and it's not me. I reported it to Twitter three years ago, nothing happened. Um, the only thing you can do is make sure that your presence online is solid. Right, that you know what you're handling your accounts. Like with me, I'm lucky. I've got a, a blog with thousands of posts. My picture is that that's me, and that's not, and, and that's kind of hard to replicate. Uh, but yeah, strong passwords is is really important. And no human can can create a better password than a machine. So if you think you got a good password, you don't. If you use the same password more than once, you're making a huge mistake. You have a different password for every single different site so that when that site gets hacked, because what happens when hackers go into a site, first thing that they do is that if they get a password is that they test it on every single major social media platform. So if you're using the same one, they've got it like that. And then what do they, and if, the, and if, and if it's the same one as your, uh, as your Gmail account or, or, or your email account, is that they'll go in, they'll reset the password. And now they've got your email. How do you change a social media account without email? Right, because that's what they always use, right? Um, so yeah, it, unfortunately, it's scarier now than it was ten years ago. Um, so uh, um, and, and and for me, what do I I do is that so one password. That's because people I know who know this stuff said, Harold, you got to have one password, right? Um, and a number of other types of things. So I I learn my network keeps me up to date. So. I have some friends of mine who are really in, into uh, internet security, and so they're following people like Bruce Schneier and Chris Chauvin and a, a number of other people who are, you know, working on you know this NSA stuff and all the other issues going around. I don't understand it, but I know people who know people, and I can under, and I can get my information that way. No. None of us are smart enough, right? <laughs> and this stuff is changing, and the kids, for the most part, don't know. They really don't. Is that I would this whole the the younger generation cyber literate and things like that. Most I mean my kids have just finished the got finished the schooling system. I've got one graduating from university, and I remember when they were in high school. Is that uh, I asked what the practices were and what the what the other kids were doing, and these kids are not really tech savvy. They may be tech literate, but they're not tech savvy. But we've got to teach them. It's, it's, this is our job, right? We're the generation. Anybody over thirty, we should be, you know, setting the example. See, I put Connie to sleep. She was, oh. <laughs> she was networking. So I have two questions, so I'm gonna do two here. One is, as a, a faculty member, we're very time conscious, phobic, whatever you wanna call it, we're always worried about time. Um, what kind of an initial time investment do you think it will take to get going on this? I mean, that's always a limitation oh. for folks that 
whether they're busy or not, perceive themselves to be busy. And then also, back to the last comment you made, you know, we're always talking about information literacy with students. And you're, like for that example, you're relying that your, your social, your network is getting legitimate primary source on this one password, for example. Well, how do you know if your network's any good, if you're not experienced in the first place? Yeah. Okay, I'll start with the second one. How do you know your network's any good? Uh, is that, you know, in my network is I have different relationships, right? So, so in the case of uh, like something like 1Password is that, you know, the guy who recommended it is the guy who built my website and I've known for 15 years and he's the one who's up to date on that kind of stuff. So I have a level of trust and confidence in him. And I think that, but then there are other people who I've never met face to face, but I've known online for a long period of time and they have a reputation and that, and that you uh, work through the reputation on that. So it's uh, actually, if we can, can, can you read the bottom left hand knowledge filters? I'll quickly go th through this. So there are different ways that we, sh we can filter knowledge. And okay, one is through naive filtering. Naive, which, which is, a, so there's three human ones. Naive, expert, and network. So naive is I'm just going to anybody and getting my information from anywhere. Expert is I'm going to the acknowledged expert on that. And then the best one is a network of experts, is that I have a network of experts who, who, from which I get consensus that, okay, these five experts on network security all recommend a password manager. That's got to be a good advice on that. So, so the, the chances of that being the right one is, is, is good for me. And then in terms, we also have mechanical filters, heuristic filters, you know what they are, and uh, there are sites like Reddit that are here, so that the stuff that gets rated by the community r rises to the top. And then of course, algorithmic ones like Google, in which I do a Google search, the number one search on the, you know, the best um, password manager would be the number one on that. But if you're thinking about what would, be the, what would be the best filter for that type of information, it would probably be a human network filter to give you that kind of information. But you know, maybe to find the best restaurant in town, it might be to use a heuristic filter instead, only from the local population. So there's diff so in parts of PKM is that this is what I teach is that there are different ways of filtering and getting this information. Now the first question was on oh the, oh yeah um, time. Okay, so uh, Beth Cantor, I don't know if anybody knows Beth. Beth uh, writes on uh, technology for nonprofits. She's probably the number one in the world on that. Uh, she she has more um, um, she, she has more LinkedIn connections than Conan O'Brien, only because Conan took her to task a number of years ago, and uh, he tried to build a, big, a bigger network than she did, and she won out. So Beth's, Beth's a good friend of mine. Um, anyway. Beth actually took my six cent share and she talked about three, uh, what, what she recommended would be a, a good routine. And this is, there's lots of examples. The place, place to go is on my site. If you just Google my name and what is your PKM routine, you'll find it. Um, is that, so she was saying like seek, you know, 15 minutes twice daily, cents, 30 to 60 minutes daily. It's a, that's a bit much for most people. And then share um, 15 minutes twice daily. Um, it really depends. Uh, it depends what you're doing. My partner, uh, uh, Charles Jennings, uh, who's in the UK, he writes probably one blog post a month. But his posts are big and they're deep and they're good. And that's okay. You know, whereas I write a lot more. And I know some people who write like three a day. It doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, one thing I think that you want to look for is that what can I not do so I can do this? What can I get rid of? So I cannot do this. So one thing, an easy one, is that do, if you respond to email responses and, and ask uh, people have questions, well, why don't you respond on a blog and then just give them the link to the blog post so the next person who asks the same question, you can send them the link and you've just saved yourself some time. Well, you can do that as an internal blog or as an external blog. And that, that routine of putting all that stuff in one place, which is now searchable, findable, shareable, you know, as opposed to where, which email was that that I sent them to, right? So, so it's the whole notion of I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to seek out information, I'm going to make sense of it, but I'm going to share it in a way in which maybe I'm not going to share it today. So you do, using things like social bookmarks, does social bookmarks like Digo or Delicious, right? There are places in which instead of having my bookmarks on my computer, I have them on this website that I can make public and shareable. 
and I can tag them, and I can highlight things, and I can make comments. So it's like an annotated bibliography that lives. And so I have thousands of these, and I have them by various subjects. I have one that I did for my kids all through school, and it was called Student Resources. So anytime I found something of interest, it was Student Resources. And in their browser, I had a link to Student Resources, and sometimes they'd ask me a question, say, check and see what Dad put on Student Resources. Well, that's kind of cool, we'll try that out. So it's preparing, having things ready so that they are shareable at the right time is part of the discipline as well. Did that cover it? Or? Um, I'm cognizant of time as well as 20 after. We can carry on the, con I, I, I'm online, so I'm, I'm H Jarkey online. Uh, I'm, I do answer emails sometimes. Harold, you might uh, just uh, mention tomorrow afternoon. Oh yes, okay, yep. So tomorrow afternoon is the, sec is the lab that goes to this and uh, tell anybody else if you, if you found this part interesting. What we're going to look at, the ver at a very specific thing uh, tomorrow. It's going to be a hands-on exercise about how you can analyze your own professional network and how you can look at them to see whether or not there are any holes or gaps or opportunities within them. So it's, it's going to be a sit down, write, exchange uh, type of thing. It's the first exercise that I do in my online workshop and it's always the most popular. And so, uh, uh, and that's, we've got about an hour and a half, two hours, I think, for that. Uh, is that right? Yeah. So that's tomorrow at what time, do you know? Two? Three, three. three o'clock. Three o'clock. And that's here, isn't it? It is. Okay, so tomorrow at three o'clock, I presume we'll have twice as many people. And then on Friday. Uh, oh, at, so, uh, fr so Friday, I'm doing a presentation on uh, leadership and networks, like how, net how the network era is changing the way that effective leadership works is that what worked 50 years ago is not going to work when everybody's connected and everybody can talk about you and everybody's on Yik Yak. And, um, and then if that'll be followed by a, a workshop and we'll be doing a value network analysis. And value network analysis is a visualization process in which you can take a look at, a, at an ecosystem. In this case, we'll be looking at uh, probably the university or the, the larger university. And you take a look at roles and you look at value um, uh, transfer both um, uh, tangible and intangible value transfer. And it's a very interesting way to look at an organization because it removes roles, it removes titles, removes the people, and it lets you look at it from a different perspective. So it's a visualization uh, exercise on that. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a very easy technique to learn that you can then use in all sorts of other settings. And that's Friday, and then I go home Saturday. <laughs> Carol, thank you.